Haunted Ohio, Volume 1, by Chris Woodyard. In chapter 11, Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, haunted houses and servants of God. Neither religion nor reason requires us to give up a belief in ghosts. Requiem aeternam dona eas domen, et lux perpetuna luciet esis. So reads the traditional Latin of the Mass for the dead. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and may eternal light shine upon them. Many people who have come through near-death experiences speak of being bathed in a beautiful light. Mediums who send earthbound spirits on their, in, on their way instruct those spirits to go to the light. But some souls exist in the outer darkness, unable to find their way to the eternal day. The Catholic Church recognizes the state as purgatory. Some spirits call it hell. The Ghost of the Old Pri Priory one such tormented spirit was a priest I will call Father Ambrose. He was a priest at St. Joseph's at Somerset, the oldest Catholic church in Ohio, also known as the Old Priory, after the Dominicans who ran a cemetery there. Seminary there. The church sits on a slight hill, with its facade darkened by time, and a spire that towers over the countryside. St. Joseph seems a brooding fortress keeping the devil at bay. Father Ambrose, like every priest, often said masses for the dead. The custom was for the bereft to give the priest the name of the deceased person and a token stipended of a dollar. The priest would say the requested number of masses, which hopefully would shorten the loved one's time in purgatory. Father Amorose died suddenly one day and was buried. Shortly after his death, something strange began to happen at the old priory. Repeatedly, the candles lit on the altar would be suddenly snuffed by an invisible hand. The attending priest would notion to the server to relight them, whereupon they would flare up again. People began to wonder whether the old priory was haunted by an evil spirit, until the ghost of Father Ambrose returned. He was seen fleetingly in the hallways. He haunted the priest's cells, looming as a dark figure at the foot of the bed. Most frequently, he appeared in the sa sacristy, where the priests were robing for mass. He looked sorrowfully at them, but he never spoke. His brother wondered his brothers wondered if Father Ambrose had committed some sin that had gone unconfessed. They said masses for him. Father Ambrose appeared again in the sacristy, looking more mournful than ever. The candles still went out. Puzzled, the community talked about it. Oh, and talked it over, and decided that Father Ambrose had died before he could say some masses that had been paid for. Each priest added a new mass intention, for an unknown intention of Father Ambrose. On the altar, the candles blazed up brightly. The spirit of Father Ambrose, his obligation satisfied, was never seen again at the old priory. Still in the habit. Sister Mary Dominique had seated herself at dinner in the refectory at the Dominican Cav Covenant in Lancaster when she realized that she had never left that she had left the light on in her cell. She excused herself and left the refectory just as the soup was served. The nun hurried silently up the corridor to the staircase that led up to the nun's cells. Sister Mary Dominique switched off the light in her cell and, tucking her hands under her scalpular, had hastened back to dinner. On her way down the stairs, she passed another nun coming up. Even though the starched headdress made it difficult to have any real peripheral vision, 
She recognized the elderly Sister Mary Frances, stumbling up the stairs. Sister Mary Dominique got as far as the door of the refectory when she realized that there was no empty chair in the room but her own. She glanced fervently out her. No nun was missing from place. Mechanically, she ate her soup and wondered what in the world Mary, Sister Mary Frances died was, what in the world Sister Mary Frances died, dead for several weeks had forgotten. Perhaps, she mused, after a lifetime in the covenant, the nun was simply following the rule by force of habit. Come, ch uh, fear of the Lord. Come, children, hearken to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Psalms 23:12. These haunting words are carved above the door to Nazareth Hall in Grand Rapids. A more fitting motto might have been, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. For the former boarding school has a whole host of sinister stories woven about it, as thick as the trees that now encroach on the abandoned building. The academy, which boasts a tower and massive brick chimneys, was built in 1927 as a boys' boarding school, run by the nuns of the Ursuline Covenant of the Sacred Heart. It closed in 1982 for financial reasons and has been sitting for sale empty ever since. Young trees have crept up to the walls of the academy while vandals and ghost seekers have broken windows and damaged the interior. One of the many tales about the academy states that several students were molested by a priest. One of the boys hung himself on a tree on the academy grounds. His, dis his despairing soul, shut forever out of heaven, roams the estate. Another story tells of a teaching nun who went insane and slaughtered a number of innocents, then turned the knife on herself. Law enforcement officers declared that the story is without foundation, that no nun and no children ever died at Nazareth. He also wishes that thrill-seekers would stop trying to break into the academy. Several college students who invaded the premises wished they hadn't. First they heard moans, then a dark-robed figure leaped out of the blackness and chased them down the hallway. Another student saw a lantern -like light bobbing in one of the upstairs windows around midnight. An earthbound nun seeking new victims or trying to find her way out of hell. The Sweet By and By The famous minister, preacher, and inspirational writer Norman Vincent Peale was born in Bowersville in Greene County in 1898. As a man of God, he is well acquainted with miracles. He describes his encounters with the world beyond in The True Joy of Positive Living, an autobiography. I was seated on the platform of a huge auditorium in Sea Island, Georgia. Some 10,000 persons filled the building. They were singing hymns. I watched several hundred come streaming down the aisles, singing that old hymn, At the Cross, At the Cross. Then I saw him, my father who had died at age 85 long before. He came striding down the aisle singing. He appeared to be about 40 years old in the prime of life, no more arthritis, no sign of stroke or enfeebled body. He was vigorous and obviously happy. He gave every evidence of enjoying life. I was spellbound, completely lost in what I was seeing. The huge audience faded away. I was only with him. Getting closer, he smiled that great old smile of his and raised his arm in the old-time familiar gesture as he moved strongly forward on sprightfully steps. I arose from the chair, advanced to the edge of the platform reaching for him, and then he was gone, leaving me shaken, somewhat embarrassed by my actions, but happy at the same time.
Not only did Peel experience the presence of his parents after their deaths, but he traveled back in time to when they were young, on a visit to, old fa to an old family home in Norwood, it seems to Peel. That I removed from worldly reality, and once again I was a small boy standing on the sidewalk, holding the hand of my little brother Bob. The two of us were dressed as children were in those days. We were waiting for mother and father. Then the door opened, and they moved down the steps. Mother was wearing an old-fashioned dress that react that reached her foot her shoe tops. The dress seems to be made of a lace-like material, with a full skirt and a narrow waist, and a high collar giving a choker effect. Her hair was piled high, and a hat added grace and charm. She seemed about thirty-five years of age. Father appeared to be about forty and was dressed in a suit of a dark blue serge, a derby hat atop his head. He took Mother's arm and, with his accustomed vigor and old-style courtesy, was escorting her down the steps. They were smiling at us. The experience was so completely real, and I was so lost in it, that I startled to rush. That I started to rush towards them. That broke the spell, and the vision vanished. Perhaps we live in an unobstructed universe, where those we have loved long ago and lost for a while may now and then brush our lives with their loving presence. And perhaps such a gracious experience is meant to say, we shall meet again, as an old hymn expressed it in the sweet by and by. What conclusion does the spirit-filled man draw from his experiences? One, our loved ones who have died in the Lord are not dead. Two, they live and grow and are well and happy. And three, their love for us continues. Four, they are near. Episcalopian. Opus Episcalopian. Nope, that's not being said right. Bishop William Montgomery Brown was a legend in his own time, known as the Red Bishop or the Bad Bishop Brown for his radical beliefs. He denounced what he called the supernaturalistic fictions of the Bible and belief in supernaturalistic gods. In 1942, Brown was tried in the first heresy trial to be held in over a hundred in over a thousand years, convicted and defrocked. Outraged by social injustice, Brown espoused communism in his later years, styling himself Espouskis and Parbus Balliskivicum et Ifidelium, Bishop to the Bolsheviks and Infidels. The bishop was a tall, well-built man in a stately air, with a stately air. With his shoulder-length cascade of white hair, he radiated wisdom and kindness. Many stories are told of his generosity and his charities. If a tramp called at the rectory, the bishop would give him a, co a cake of soap, then send him to a local man's outfitters with a note telling the shopkeep to give the tramp a pair of pants or a shirt and put him on his bill. B Bishop Brown could well afford to be generous. In 1885, he married the immensely wealthy Ella Bradford, heiress of a prominent Cleveland woman. They first met, El met when Ella's mother was seen, had seen promise in Brown and at his pra patroness had sent him to educate at Canyon College. The bishop and his new bride could not have been more different. He was tall and massive, she was small and dainty. He loved vigorous outdoor exercise, and she preferred the parlor. He enjoyed entertaining and meeting people, and she was shy and retiring. A photograph taken on his wedding day shows a confident, poised leader of men. Her portrait in satin and tule, 
is that of a different, almost timid figure. Yet, despite Miss Brown's ill health and her childlessness, the marriage, which lasted until the, her death in 1935, was a happy one. He called her precious. As a wedding present, Ella's mother built the couple a lavish rectory and galleon that dwarfed the tiny ep Eposcal church at the, across the street. Dubbed Brunel Brunella College, after the new bride, the house was surrounded by a lacy iron fence. The bishop added a glassed-in walkway to the little house that served as his study so that he could have a place to take his constitutional on damp days. After the bishop's death in 1937, it was discovered that he has had willed the bulk of his fortune to the community part to the communist party since the party was outlawed in ohio legally it did not exist although it tried unsuccessfully to claim the money the trustees gave the interest on the estate to galleon hospital and kenyon college but there remained the problem of the house Brown had told his secretary that he wanted Brownella College to become a home for student nurses. There was already housing for nurses at the hospital, so Brownella College stood untouched for 35 years while the trustees debated about what to do with it. My grandparents lived in Galleon, and as I was a child, I was fascinated by the cottage. A caretaker lived on the grounds. He mowed the grass and weeded the buds of tiger lilies that rioted around the fence. The trim of the house was a deep green that blended in with all the tall shrubbery and the ivy that outgrew the structure. From the sidewalk I could see the chairs in the enclosed porch, surrounded in dust cloths like overstuffed corpses. Once in a great while, I would see a light on in one of the windows, accidentally left on by the caretaker, said my grandmother, but I knew it was the bishop's ghost. My greatest ambition was to visit the house, but I was told that nobody was allowed in, except for the caretaker and the trustees of the estate, which made it all the more mysterious. In the early 1970s, the cottage was donated to the Galleon Historical Society. Lovingly restored by the Historical Society volunteers, Brownella Cottage was a charming architectural time capsule. The rooms have been repainted in the pale green, dusty rose and robin as eggs blue of the early 90s, of the early 1900s, that one, with stenciled borders that copy the original wallpaper patterns. The house's furnishings are intact. The tiles in the entrance that spell the Latin greeting Salve. The bishop was fond of music, so the music room with the piano, reed organ, and the wind-up music box adjoins the central reception area with its covered wooden coffered with its coffered wooden ceilings. Mrs. Brown's favorite sitting room with the tower room heated by a unique circular radiator looks out onto the out onto one of the house's six porches in the kitchen stands a magnificent zinc lined oak ice box with brass hinges and mirrored shelves even the original house telephone is there each button labeled e brown study carison cartage house in faded ink. The bishop's book-lined study is decorated with ecclesiastical motifs, stenciled across on the walls Alpha and Omega spelled out on the tiles on the, earth, on the hearth. Upstairs are bedrooms crammed with high-backed beds and mirrored d dressers. There are the latest modern innovations, a bathroom with a corner marble sink and closets where whose lights go on automatically when you open the door. Upstairs, two is, two is the turret room and decorated in sea green and 
Eudenel brocade, where Ella's creamy satin bridal gown and tiny embroidered side lace boots are preserved in a glass case like a coffin. She died in this room. The last caretaker took a series of photos of the outside of the house. When they were developed, they showed, they showed Polly, a volunteer guide, the photo which he had taken of the turreted corner of the house that houses Ella's room. In the window was the unmistakable human figure. I locked up the house, he told Polly, quietly, and I was outside, so who's that? Newly married, he brought his bride home to his caretaker's apartment, which had been carved out of the attic. She spent two nights there and refused to stay, in, stay another night, terrified by something about the house. Six-year-old Stephanie visited Brownalla Cottage with her mother. While her mother chatted with the guide, Stephanie studied the pictures on the wall until her attention was caught by a movement on the stairs next to the big clock on the landing. She didn't say anything until they were on their way home and her mother was talking about the house's haunted reputation. Then she said, I think I saw something on the stairs. Stephanie described a woman in a white dress with her hair in a bun, standing just beyond the landing with her hands on the, ra on the stair rail. I looked at her for a little bit, and then, poof, she disappeared. It might have just been my imagination, she added apologetically. Couldn't it have been a guide who had showed us around upstairs, asked her mother. But Stephanie was sure it was not. She pointed out that the upstairs guide had worn a maroon dress and her hair was loose. In no way did she resemble whatever it is that Stephanie saw on the stairs. Stephanie's mother was worried by the incident and even asked Stephanie's teacher if she thought Stephanie was a fanciful child or one given to making up stories. Absolutely not. She's very truthful, was the teacher's reply. Some say that the bishop still haunts the house. Nick lived just around the corner from the cottage, which had a strange reputation after Brown's death. Most people wouldn't go near the place after dark. When Nick was fifteen, his visiting, co his visiting cousin dared him to peek into the window of the Bishop Brown's study. The two boys tiptoed across the lawn to the bushes surrounding the small building. Nick stood up, his hands trembling on the sill, and looked in at the tall window. He came face to face with a man standing in the darkness, his white face pressed to the glass, peering at them. Nick and his cousin raced across the lawn, taking the tall iron fence in one bound, just the caretaker trying to give two trespassers a scare, or the bishop pondering eternity in his study. There are those who say that they have seen the figure of the bishop t taking his constitutional in the long glass walkway. He walks slowly absorbed in some improving book while the rain patters on the roof. He casts no shadow on the glass. The day I visited, it was raining. As I walked to the bishop's little brick study, I studied the delicate patterns of leaves and ferns that had been pressed into the walkway cement floor so long ago. Standing in the study at the end of the glass tunnel, time shifted. I could almost see the bishop sitting still in a pool of lamplight at his desk, pen in hand. I looked back towards the main house with a strong sense that the air would darken, and I would see a tall, shadowy figure stride by the rain-streaked glass. But nothing happened. The guides at Brunella Cottage do not believe that Bishop Brown returns to the house. The bishop, they say was a scientific-minded man of anti-superstitious bent. In one of his pamphlets, he stated, What is the greatest of all known facts? The fact that man is part of nature, evolved out of the image and likeness of a beast, not made in the image and the likeness of God, Jehovah, and 
therefore death as surely ends all for humans as for animals as a man who did not believe in the supernatural did not believe in an afterlife Bishop Brown would not have believed in the ghost of himself in the ghost of a prayer in the covenant of St. Thomas and in Zanesville the nuns were assembled for general recreation. Senior, or se, senior? I don't know what SR stands for. SR Helen had forgotten her sewing basket, so she asked permission to be excused to fetch it. Passing the chapel on her way back from her cell, she opened the door, as was the custom of the com of the community just to say hello to Jesus. When she opened the door, she saw a nun kneeling at the altar rail adorn, adorning the tabernacle. Not wishing to disturb her sister, as Sir Helen quickly closed the door and went along her, to her recreation. At recreation, the nuns are allowed to talk freely, and as Sir Helen speculated out loud about the identity of the nun at the altar. There was an embarrassed silence. Helen looked about, puzzled that no one seemed to be missing. Nobody else besides you left the room, said one sister, her eyes fixed on the stocking she was darning. And I've seen her too. At that, several other nuns confessed that they had also seen the figure in front of the altar. No use going back to see if she's still there. She won't be if you go looking for her said Margaret crustily. I know, she added. I've tried it. In a flurry of excited chatter, it was found that no one ever knew who the ghostly nun was. No living sister had ever seen her face. And none knew whether she exists in purgatory, doing penance for an unknown sin, or whether she was found, has found paradise, praising God for eternity before the altar of the Lord. The Old Serpent Chester Bedell of North Benton was a real hell-raiser. He was a self-proclaimed atheist, an infidel his neighbors muttered scandalized. After his wife's family tried to force prebrestorarian pre doctrines on his stiff-necked pot on the stiff-necked pioneer, he revolted and began his crusade against the church. He made trips to the Holy Land and studied the scriptures religiously to gather ammunition to use against Christianity. He wrote a book called 21 Battles Fought by Chester Bendel with Relations and, and pre Presbyterian Intolerance with a short sketch of his life. He even went so far as to have a bronze statue of himself made to be placed on his grave. He was depicted holding an anti-Christ creed, trampling a scroll labeled superstition, or some said, stamping on a stack of Bibles. Bedell went to his death in 1908, mutely unrepentant, and seemingly unaware of the flames licking like serpents' tongues at his heels. Just after his burial, people began to whisper that he had challenged God on his deathbed. If there is a God, he was reputed to have said, let snakes infest my grave. God is not mocked. The rumor spread that if you approached the grave, the ground seemed to writhe and churn with hundreds of snakes. Common garter snakes, sinister black snakes, poisonous copperheads. The faithful came from all over the U.S. to see the snakes proclaiming the truth of the gospel. No doubt one or two of the pious smiled as they thought of stinging asps, of stinging wasps, tormenting Bedell for eternity. In 1934, in, in 1943, the statue of Bedell was taken down and hidden away by his family tired of the old scandal. They still don't like to talk about it. As for the snakes, 
Were they an optical illusion, a practical joke, a genuine plague of serpents? Or did they truly proclaim the doom of the great heretic in the jaws of the old serpent himself? Some visitors still claim to see the snakes. Others scoff as it appears to be an ordinary grave. Yet if I were visiting, I think I would tread lightly. A Pillar of Fire by Night Early Church A small county church in Wheeling Township, Gurney County, Gersney? Gersney County, was founded by the Reverend John Early, who went to his rest in 1853. The, that rest was to be disturbed only ten years later by an appalling church desecration. A gang of outlaws had terrorized the neighborhood for some time, uprooting crops, destroying farm machinery, killing horses, and in one instance, it was whispered, a schoolmaster. These sons of Belial, no doubt thrilled by the thought of sacrilege, stole a lamb, the pet of a crippled boy, and carried it to Early's church, where they broke open the door. One placed the open Bible on the altar, another cut the lamb's throat. The blood gushed forth, soaking the pages of the Bible and flowing down the altar to stand in an obscene pool at its base. The stench in the church was unspeakable. Another young man claimed to be speaking, climbed into the speaking platform. John Early, he roared, thumping his fist on the pulpit, come forth from your grave. At this, the door of the church burst open, and all the house was filled with smoke. Through the chaos came a pillar of fire that swayed with horrible slowness lowlessness down the aisle. A beam of light shot out of the smoke and struck the man in the pulpit spot, in the pulpit's blind. He could not stand or speak, and the other desecrators dragged him as they fled, stumbling and incoherent with terror. Behind them on the altar, the dying lamb twitched. When worshippers arrived on the, on the next Lord's Day, they found the doors broken open. Inside, the sanctuary reeked with the stench of the rotting lamb, which was carried from the church on two sticks. No church services were held that day or for two weeks. That was how foul the old odor was. Many of the congregation wanted to track down the desecrators, but a descendant of John Early spoke, saying, Let them alone. This is God's house that has been desecrated, and God will take care of it. God did. One by one, tortured by their consciousness, the men came forward. They pleaded to be arrested and punished so they could clear themselves, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, so no one in the congregation would swear out a complaint. Later, the desecrators went mad. The pulpit pounder died stone blind. His father, a drunkard, died so awful a death that he kicked the bed down. Two were imprisoned for murder. All died in various horrid ways. If there were monsters, it is not recorded. If there were mourners, it is not recorded, writes the chronicler. News came of the death of all of them. They all died without hope. Angel over Bellbrook? Bellbrook? Angels over Bellbrook? That one. From an 1890s edition of the Bellbrook Moon comes this curious story of heavenly visit visitate visitants. Why couldn't you have just said visitors? <laughs> I will mention one more strange phenomenon that I have witnessed in Bellbrook. August 19th, 1841. 
We were viewing what, to us, was an unusual sight in the shape of an unusual band. When we noticed exit... No. When we noticed exiting excited families of the neighborhood in the streets viewing the southern sky, a glance in that direction showed a phenomena which consisted of angels formed in solemn procession, marching with stately tread through the realms of space in full view. In the heavens, marching by twos, was a parade of what appeared to be human forms clad in flowing robes. As cast as one company consisting of ten to fifteen couples would appear from view, another would take its place, and the vision lasted ten minutes. The forms were so lifelike that seemingly the moments and the movements of the limbs could be distinguished. The people at the time were gratefully excited at the angelic visitation, and in several instances, family carried, families carried invalids out of the doors that they might view the scene. The occurrence took place between nine and ten o'clock in the evening. The forms of the spirit visitors were, to all appearances, covered by a gauzy substance and their existence in companies was visible in the eye through a space of probably thirty degrees in the northwest direction. No music of any kind was heard, and yet the angels mu moved in beautiful harmony. Scenes such as this stir up impulses of the store, of the soul, calling us to higher planes of inspiration and glory, giving us, as it were, a foretaste of bliss, that is in the heaven for all of brotherhood of man. The Ghostly Penitent Our Lady's Dorm, as it was known then, was found on the, was found on the third floor of the old mother house at St. Mary's of the Springs, Columbus. That was said weird. Hold on, I'm just going to redo that. The Ghostly Penitent Our Lady's Dorm, as it was known then, was found on the third floor of the old mother house at St. Mary's of the Springs, Columbus. The large room was divided into neat cubicles by muslin curtains that surrounded each bed. Since silence was observed at night, it was a rule that all were to walk as quietly as possible. It was also a rule that no one was supposed to be out of bed at night. So it was a shock to the nuns tucked up in their beds to hear footsteps that definitely should not have been there. They were light footsteps like a woman's, and they pattered through the main door up at the center aisle of the dorm itself. They were heard going into a closet at the end of the room, and there they ceased. Our Lady's dorm had been, a, been the Mother House Chapel before the new chapel had been built. The closet had originally been a confessional in the old chapel. Perhaps the footsteps belonged to a nun who tried but failed to confess some sin when she was living. Unable to rest, every night she visits the confessional, hoping, each night more hopelessly, to hear a ghostly voice behind the screen pronounce an absolution so she can go to the light. <laughs>